Hi, welcome to this session, five essentials for your math instruction within your MTSS framework. My name is Sarah Powell. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And if you would like the slide deck and handouts that go along with this presentation, you're welcome to visit my website. You see the web address there. You're also welcome to email me or find me on social media if you want to talk a lot more about math instruction. But let's go ahead and get started. So as you are working together in your virtual groups today, I'd like you to say hello to your virtual friends. So in the chat or in a breakout room, where, however you are organized, go ahead and share a bit about yourself and some of the math that you support. All right, so we have five objectives for our session today. First, we are going to think about what are the core components of explicit instruction. Second, we will talk about why formal math language is important. Third, we'll dig into multiple representations that students need to understand to focus on different concepts and procedures in math. Fourth, we'll focus on ways to build fluency. And then fifth, we'll talk about two effective practices within word problem instruction. So let's go ahead and get started with the first. We do have a set of handouts. If you'd like to make notes or just follow along, we are on the first page of this handouts packet. Now, as we think about instruction in math, it's really important to think about the use of evidence-based practices. Evidence-based practice is an umbrella term that can mean a few different evidence-based intervention strategies and practices within mathematics. So one type of evidence-based practice is an evidence-based intervention. This is an intervention. It's typically packaged. It comes with everything that you need to do, need to have to implement math instruction, but it has been shown to increase math outcomes for students when it's used well. Now, a second type of evidence-based practice is an evidence-based strategy. This is a strategy, maybe it's using manipulatives or teaching explicitly, that has been shown time and time again to lead to positive math outcomes for students. And then there's always new products coming onto the market. And so some evidence-based practices are promising. They are starting to show that they lead to positive math outcomes when implemented regularly. But the thing that we don't want to do is we do not want to rely on practices that don't have an evidence base or maybe even contribute to negative outcomes for students. And so anytime we think about math instruction for students, we need to rely on evidence-based practices, things that have been shown time and time again to lead to positive math outcomes for students. So what are some evidence-based practices that we can rely on? Well, today we're going to talk about building our instructional platform. The instructional platform is the jumping off point for effective math instruction. And there are five evidence-based strategies that we should put into our instructional platform. Three of these focus on the delivery of your math instruction. So first, we wanna think about using explicit instruction. Second, we wanna think about a focus on precise math language. And third, we wanna bring in multiple representations to help students understand what the mathematics means. And then there are two strategies that we wanna embed in our instructional platform. One is building fluency, and the other is a focus on problem solving instruction. And our session today will focus on each of these five evidence-based practices that are in our instructional platform. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's first talk about those core components of explicit instruction. 
So we're going to focus on explicit instruction. And how does this fit within our instructional platform? It's the first component of our instructional platform. All right, so if you're following along with the handouts and you wanna make any notes, we are going to fill in this graphic organizer right here. Your graphic organizer looked like that, mine looks like this. So this is the model of explicit instruction that comes from the National Center on Intensive Intervention. If you want to see any of their materials at any time, you can visit their website, which is intensiveintervention.org. But there we will see a model of explicit instruction that involves three components, modeling, practice, and then supports that are used both in modeling and in practice. So let's talk about that modeling first. Modeling is a dialogue between the teacher, which might be you or the teachers that you support, and the students that are working with that teacher. Anytime we model, we want to give students a step-by-step -step explanation for how to solve a specific type of math problem. And the teacher might do one modeled problem, especially if it's a longer type of problem, or you might do several different problems. It's really up to the timing and the students that you're working with to determine how many models you may do in a lesson. So let's think about that modeling. I want to imagine that we are teaching this problem here, 26 plus 79. So here I have the teacher and I have a group of students. I, I think that looks like a group of students, but I've also noticed that it looks like some choir singers, but we'll just imagine for today that they're a group of students. So as I start my explanation as the teacher, I'm first going to introduce, here's what we're doing today, and here's why that's important. So you can read this example. Today we're learning about addition, and this is important because sometimes you have different amounts, maybe like money, and you wanna understand how much money you have altogether. And then you're going to follow that with a step-by-step -step explanation on how to solve this problem. So let's see what this teacher does here. So first thing the teacher says is, hey, we're going to solve a problem together. What's the problem? And notice immediately the students are now dialoguing with the teacher about this problem. So they're just repeating, oh, this problem is 26 plus 79. And then the teacher might say, well, to solve this problem, we have to first decide what are we going to do? Are we going to add, subtract, multiply, or divide? And so the students have to look at this problem and they have to say, I'm going to add. And then immediately I would ask, well, how did you know that you were going to add? And I want the students to look at the plus sign. That's really important for a problem like this because the single biggest error that students make in math and the elementary grades is that they do the wrong operation. And you've probably seen this. You have students that subtract when they're supposed to add, or maybe they divide when they're supposed to multiply, and that's because they don't pay attention to those signs. And so as a teacher, I'm having them focus on the signs and explain, well, how did you know that we were going to add? And then I'm going to follow that with an introduction of how we are going to add the, this problem today. So on this problem, we are going to use the partial sum strategy. And I want students to get used to that language. So I'd ask them to say that with me. Let's say partial sums together. And then I introduce the partial sum strategy. I might say, well, with this partial sum strategy, we'll always start adding with the greatest place value. In this problem, what is the greatest place value? So the students are helping me figure that out. And then I emphasize, well, if we're adding the tens, then we're adding 20 plus 70. What does it mean to add 20 plus 70? So the students help us with that. And then we move forward to figure out, well, what do I do with this information? Now that I know that 20 plus 70 is 90, where should I write this? So here I talk about that 90 being a partial sum and having students explain that 90 is the partial sum when we add the tens. And then we move to the ones. Now what are we going to add? We'll add six plus nine. Here I would continue as a teacher, I would ask, well, what does it mean to add six plus nine? That equals what? And the students would say 15. And then I'd talk about, well, where are we gonna write that 15? And then I would wanna talk about that this 15 also represents a partial sum. And now that we have our partial sums, we will add the partial sums together. So what will we add? Here we would add 90 plus 15. And then as I finish this problem up, we talk about what does it mean to add 90 plus 15. We think, think about how did we add those numbers and students may add them in different ways. So you might have different responses there. And then finally, I'd like the students to review, well, what did we do when we added 26 plus 79? And students do the review there. 
Now, you probably weren't counting, but I was. And I want to point out that in this modeled example of adding 26 plus 79, the teacher had 15 prompts and the students responded 15 times. So that really shows this dialogue between the teacher and the student. So the other thing that's important to think about in modeling is what are the examples that we are using when we're modeling? We want to make sure that those examples are thoughtfully planned because you might not have a lot of time. You might say, I am only able to do one modeled problem today. And so you better make the best modeled problem that you can possibly make because quickly students are going to start to practice. So really thoughtfully plan the examples that you're going to bring into your modeling. So now we are going to move from modeling into practice. Now practice is going to continue as a dialogue between the teacher and the group of students. And practice is so important because practice is where students learn math. The model sets us up for success, but the practice is where that learning of math occurs. So what types of practice should we do with our students? Well, we want to engage students in guided practice. So guided practice is where the teacher and the group of students are working together. In a whole classroom, it might be the teacher working something on a document camera, and then all the students are at their desks working the same problem. In a small group, it might be me, the teacher, sitting here with a group of three or four students, and maybe we're all using manipulatives to solve the same problem, and we're writing things on our whiteboards. So there's lots of different ways that this guided practice can, uh, lots of different ways that it can be operationalized. And it can also occur with peers. So guided practice can, uh, can occur when students are working in partner pairs. And then as we uh, engage students in guided practice, we also want to engage students in independent practice. Independent practice is where students are working on their own or independently, but we still want to make sure that we're providing feedback to that. So a student uh, might go and practice solving word problems, and so the teacher says, now you'll practice this on your own. Do you remember to use your tech strategy? So that students have a little prompt to take with them as they start to do their independent practice. So that is a little bit about practice. Now what I want you to notice about these supports is that this rectangle of supports falls under both modeling and practice. So supports should be used in both modeling and practice. And what are three supports that are really important to use? First, it's really important to ask students a lot of different questions and prompt students a lot. In our example that we just saw, I think I counted that the students were prompted 15 times and the students responded 15 times. That gives me a lot of information about how well students understand the math that we are working on. So I might ask some low level questions. These are those what questions or those when questions. So what is seven times nine might be a low level question for some students. And typically these are a one or two term response that students have there. But then I might ask some higher level questions such as why do we use zero pairs? And here you can see there's a much longer explanation that students would provide when I'm asking a why question or a how question. So we want to ask a lot of questions and we want to ask those questions frequently. If we ask questions frequently, we're checking students' attention, we're checking the engagement of students, and we're also keeping students really actively involved in the lesson. So our typical rule of thumb when we are designing interventions is that when it comes to modeling and guided practice, students should respond in some way every 30 to 60 seconds. So if 60 seconds has gone by and the students haven't responded in some way, you're probably starting to lose the attention and the engagement of your students. So let's think about ways that students can respond. Students can respond orally. Maybe they do a choral response, or maybe they do a turn and talk to the partner, or maybe students raise their hand and we ask one student to share their ideas. Students can do written responses. So maybe it's write this on your whiteboard, or uh, write this on your workbook, or write this on your paper. Students can respond by showing things with manipulatives. Maybe you're doing something with fractions and students are getting their fraction tiles out and showing you how to solve that problem. Maybe they're working with base 10 blocks. That would be another manipulative that we could use. 
Maybe students are responding with drawing. Maybe they're drawing something on their whiteboard. Maybe they're drawing a number line and marking different numbers on that number line. Maybe they're drawing a graphic organizer and filling that in. And then students also can respond with gestures. I do a lot of work in word problem solving and we ask students, what kind of word problem is this? And if a student did this gesture, I would know immediately they are stopped talking about word problems of a total where parts are put together for a total. So gestures can be also used as a response method as well. And then as we ask those questions and as we ask students to frequently respond, we have to provide feedback to those responses. So we want to provide affirmative feedback to tell students what they're doing well. We also want to provide corrective or supportive feedback. So whenever students have a misconception or they make a mistake, let's say, hey, let's look at that again. Let's talk through that part of the problem so that students learn the math correctly the first time and they don't learn all these errors and then we have to go back and unlearn that and then learn it correctly again. So really think about that role of corrective feedback. So those are some of the supports that you may wanna consider as you model and practice. So I've been doing a little bit of talking and I think it's now time for you to talk virtually, whether that's in the chat or in the breakout room. And so my question for you, I have two questions. First, look at this model of explicit instruction and talk about what are some of your strengths with explicit instruction. And then look at this uh, model of explicit instruction and think about what are some of your opportunities for growth? What could you improve upon? What could you do a little bit better? Talk about that for two minutes. So you just discussed explicit instruction and modeling and practice within explicit instruction. So I hope you are now comfortable with describing the core components of explicit instruction. And I would say that those are modeling, practice, and providing supports to students as you model and practice. So now let's look at our second objective for today, and that is a focus on use of formal math language. So we're going to move to our conversation about math language. Uh, if we're thinking about this within our instructional platform, we're now gonna layer this on top of the explicit instruction. And if you are following along with the handouts, you may wanna take some notes on this page, and we're going to fill in this table in just a few moments. So let's first talk about math vocabulary. So across grades kindergarten through eight, this is an estimation of how many vocabulary terms students are responsible for knowing within their grade level. 
Now we came to this list because we looked at several math textbooks. We moved to the back of those textbooks and went to the glossaries and we wrote down all of the terms and their definitions. Then we removed the duplicates to come up with an estimate of how many math terms students are responsible for knowing at any grade level. So in kindergarten, first and second grade, your average student there may be responsible for knowing anywhere from 110 to 140 different math terms. We see a large increase in grade three. That's when multiplication, division, and fractions come into play. So here, your average third, fourth, fifth grader might be responsible for knowing 300 to over 400, uh, almost 400 math terms. And then we see another increase as students move into the middle school grades. So there, uh, your average sixth, seventh, or eighth grader might be responsible for knowing anywhere from 400 to over 500 different math vocabulary terms. That's a tremendous amount of math language. I wonder if your mind is boggled as much as mine is. And if you are wondering, some of these terms continue from one grade level to the next, but some terms fade out and then new terms come into play. So across all of these grade levels, there were 1,221 different math vocabulary terms. Now, math vocabulary is really important because students access math vocabulary in a lot of different ways. So as you are modeling and as students are practicing, they're doing a lot of listening. They're listening to the teacher, they're listening to peers, they do probably a lot of listening to videos these days. We ask students to understand math vocabulary because they have to speak it. Maybe they answer a question or talk to their peers. Students have to do a tremendous amount of reading in math, whether that's reading a word problem or reading in a textbook or maybe even reading closed captions. And then fourth, students have to do a lot of writing in math. And all of this involves an understanding of the vocabulary of math. So we have to make sure that we are helping students understand math vocabulary. And two key components of this are to make sure that we as teachers are using formal math language and helping students understand formal math language. And we also have to make sure that we're using terms precisely. And I'll give examples of both of these. So let's first talk about that formal math language. So this is an example from an article that I wrote with my colleagues, Elizabeth Hughes and Elizabeth Stevens. And here we talked about taking informal language and transitioning it to formal math language. So on the left is a red creature. That red creature is using informal language. And on the right is a green creature, and that creature is using formal math language. So instead of asking about what number is in the tens place, if I was thinking about 135, I should formally ask what digit is in the tens place because the number is 135, but the digit is three. Instead of talking about this alligator that eats the bigger number, let's talk about the language around the inequalities. Let's say is less than or is greater than. Instead of asking students to carry in a problem such as this, let's use language of, that gets at the conceptual heart of addition, where we're regrouping or we're trading or we're exchanging. And the same thing with a subtraction problem. Instead of asking students to borrow, let's talk about regrouping or trading or exchanging. Instead of talking about fractions, where I have this top number and this bottom number, let's talk about the numerator and the denominator. Instead of asking students to reduce a fraction, that might indicate that I'm changing the value of fra the fraction. That's not the case. Let's ask students to rename the fraction or find an equivalent fraction or to simplify the fraction. Instead of asking students to read this as 4.7, that's pretty much just as I would write it on my paper, let's talk about this as uh, four and seven tenths. That really emphasizes the place value of that number. Instead of talking about this as a box, that's not a box, it's a square. Or instead of talking about that as a ball, it's not a ball, it's a circle. Or instead of talking about this as a point, that's not a point, it's the vertex. So there's many, many examples where instead of that, we could say this. And I'd like you to take a minute to think a little bit about what might some of these examples be. So what I'd like you to do right now is come up with at least three to five examples where instead of that, say this. We'll do this for a minute and then we'll come back as a group.
All right, I hope you came up with some good examples of instead of that, say this. There are probably hundreds of examples that you could have come up with. Uh, one that I usually think about is instead of answer, I could ask about the sum or the difference or the product or the quotient. And there are many others that we could add to that list. Now, in addition to using formal math language, we want to help students see that there needs to be a precision with the language of math. So here on the left-hand side, you see an example of factor and multiple. I was in a fifth grade classroom last year where students were using these terms interchangeably, but these terms shouldn't be used interchangeably. They do not mean the same thing. So we want to help students understand that factor has a meaning and multiple has a meaning, and what are the meanings of those terms and how are they different? Now, if you look on the right-hand side, these are some terms that students might hear when we're talking about fractions. And they may see these within the same unit or maybe even the same chapter or maybe even the same week or day. And so if we're using these terms all the time, can students distinguish among these terms? For example, do students know what a proper fraction is? And can they compare proper fraction to improper fraction? And how does improper fraction relate to a mixed number? And then we have this term unit fraction. What does that mean? And how is that the same or different from a proper fraction? And then how does ratio relate to fraction terminology? And what is a proportion? So those are a lot of terms that you as the teacher might know and understand precisely, but do your students understand those terms precisely? Here are some other examples. On the left-hand side, we see language related to equation and expression, and how do, those, uh, how do those differ to a formula or an inequality or a function. And then on the right-hand side, we see some ways that we name this algebraic expression. So in this, what is the coefficient? What is the constant? What is the term? And what is the variable? Here are some examples for geometry, lots of different ways that we name quadrilaterals. We also think about how do we name triangles and other different types of polygons. On the right-hand side, how do we name angles? There's so many different terms that we might be able to use, and students have to use these terms with precision. On the left, do your students understand the difference between a line of reflection and a line of symmetry? On the right, do your students know the different names for these transformations? So what is a reflection, what is a rotation, and what is a translation? And then here are some other geometry terms that students might not always use precisely. So how do we identify the different components of two-dimensional shapes and three-dimensional figures? There's a lot of language that students have to be familiar with and have to use regularly so that they understand what each of these terms means. And I'll look down here at this example on the right hand side. So there I see a prism, but that is a prism, but it's not just a prism. So we might ask students to identify, well, what type of prism is this? Is it a triangular prism, a rectangular prism, a hexagonal prism? In this example, it is a hexagonal prism, but we wanna make sure that students can identify all of the components of that prism that's presented there. So just two key components to think about here are to use formal math language. If teachers use formal math language, then students often use that same language. And then the second thing that we wanna think about is using terms precisely. So defining terms, making sure that students know when terms overlap and when terms are distinct. So what is the difference between a factor and a multiple? What is the difference between a numerator and a denominator? There are many examples that we could think about here. So I'd like us to take two minutes and talk either in the chat or in your breakout room about what are some of the strategies that you have for focusing on math language.
Hopefully you had some good conversations about focusing on math language. Things that you may have talked about are using word walls, those are great, playing games around vocabulary, using vocabulary flashcards, uh, but really just consistently talking about math language and using math language with your students, that's going to be really important as well. So we just finished talking about why formal math language is important. And so now we'll transition to our third objective for today, and that is talking about the use of different representations. So when we think about these multiple representations, we are now going to layer them onto the explicit instruction and that focus on language. So these three things together will work in tandem to help students understand the concepts and procedures of math. So let's dig into those multiple representations. Here's the handout page that we're on if you're making any notes on the handouts. All right, so when we think about multiple representations, I think about this framework here. This is the concrete pictorial abstract framework. Now, two things of note. Some of you are probably familiar with this as the concrete representational abstract, but I would argue that all of these are representations, which is why I call that R, the representational, I call it P, pictorial. And some of you might call that semi-concrete. That's another name as well. So today we'll talk about the concrete pictorial abstract. Many of you will interpret this as CRA. The other thing that's important to think about is that this isn't a sequence. Notice I have all of these overlapping and that is intentional. So if I was using base 10 blocks to go back to our problem 26 plus 79, I would likely have 26 plus 79 written right here as I am using those base 10 blocks to help students understand what does it mean to add two tens plus seven ones and so on. And so often these are overlapping. It's not one or the other. So many times when you're doing things with concrete manipulatives, you also have the abstract problem presented. The same thing when you're doing things with pictures or in the pictorial, you also have the abstract presented. And you might go back and forth. Some of your students might be doing problems in the abstract and they're having a hard time, and so you bring in those concrete manipulatives. So it doesn't have to be a sequence. It's more a framework and bringing these things in when students need this support. So what do some of these things look like? So the concrete, these are hands-on manipulatives. They're three-dimensional. I can touch and move them around to show different math concepts and procedures. So on this slide, you see some examples of algebra tiles, of the counting bears, of angle legs, and of the geo board. In the pictorial, these are two-dimensional, so they're flat images. Students might see them on a screen or on their tablet. They might see them in a workbook or on some type of worksheet. But these are two-dimensional images that can also be used to explain and understand math concepts and procedures. So here with my bears, I have a visual of what does it mean to add two plus three. I could actually touch those bears to show that two plus three is the same as five. I have a visual representation of place value. There I could count 10, 20, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. I have a visual representation of a three-dimensional figure and I have a picture of a clock. So those are some of our two-dimensional or pictorial images that we might see. Now, also in this pictorial category, I put virtual rep or virtual representations or virtual manipulatives. So here are some examples of the Cuisinaire rods, of geo boards, or of algebra tiles. And a few years ago, I put together a list of some of my favorite and free virtual manipulatives. So you're welcome to follow this QR code or this bit.ly, and it will take you to this landing page here. And what you can see is I've organized this into eight different categories. So maybe you're, you're interested in what are some of the virtual manipulatives available related to fractions and decimals. So you could click on fractions and decimals. It would take you to this page you see here at the bottom right hand side of the page. And there you have access to virtual fraction strips or fraction bars, virtual Cuisinaire rods, virtual fraction circles, virtual geo boards, virtual pattern blocks, virtual two color counters, virtual decimal strips, 
virtual, virtual place value disks, and virtual percentage strips. So lots of virtual manipulatives out there. Almost all of them are free, and many of them are excellent for use in the math classroom. So I'd like you to think about those virtual manipulatives as I transition to the abstract. So the abstract is doing math with the numbers and symbols and words. So many times if we ask adults, what does mathematics look like? They would say mathematics looks like this. But mathematics can also be hands-on tools. Mathematics can be drawings. Mathematics can be those virtual manipulatives as well. Mathematics can look like a lot of different things. So keeping in mind those virtual manipulatives, I'd like to give you, we'll do about a 90 seconds or so to explore some different virtual manipulatives. So find some virtual manipulatives or maybe share some in the chat that you've been using and then go ahead and share some of the ones that you really appreciated. Share those in the chat or in your breakout room so that we all see what are some of the different virtual manipulatives that are available out there. Go ahead and explore now. All right, hope you had fun exploring with those virtual manipulatives. You know, COVID wasn't very good for many of us, but one thing it did do is it brought a lot of new virtual math manipulatives to the market. So I, I am very excited about that. So we just finished talking about the use of different representations that students can use to help understand those math concepts and procedures. And so now we'll go into ways to build fluency. So let's talk about that building fluency and where does this fit in our instructional platform? Well, it's one of two strategies that we should embed within our instructional platform every time we teach math. So let's go ahead and talk about fluency. If you wanna take any notes about it, here's what the page that we're on for the handouts. So fluency. First, I think it's important to think about what is fluency? So if we look up fluency in the dictionary, Fluency means to do something easily and accurately. So think about how you have fluency with brushing your teeth. You do it easily and hopefully you do it accurately. Think about that you have fluency with writing something down. There's fluency all around us and it just means that you can do that thing easily and accurately. So fluency in math is doing math easily and accurately. So when we think about fluency, fluency makes math easier. When students have fluency in math, it provides less of a tax on their working memory. It also decreases the expectations for their cognitive load. And students have reported that when students are fluent in math, that they have stronger confidence with math. And then as we think about fluency, and this is at the bottom of this slide, it really is important that we think that fluency isn't just procedural, but fluency is a balance between the conceptual and the procedural. And often that learning of concepts and procedures develops in tandem, and so those things will develop at the same time. 
Now, if we think about fluency, many of our brains probably go to the operations. So fluency with adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. But fluency is everywhere in mathematics. So if you teach the early grades, you might ask your students to have counting fluency. First, it's fluency with knowing the number names in order, such as one, two, three, four. And then you ask your students to have fluency with assigning those number names to counts. Maybe if I'm counting my fingers, one, two, three, four. I did that easily and I did it accurately. Maybe you ask students to have fluency with comparing of numbers. So if you put the numbers five and eight in front of a student, which of those num numbers is greater? We'd like students to easily and accurately and say eight is greater than five. Maybe you ask students to have fluency with working with money or telling time. So first you would like students to look at a dime and say, that's a dime, it's worth 10 cents. I want you to do that easily and accurately. And here's a nickel and it's worth five cents. And then you probably ask your students to add those together. So 10 plus five is 15. I did that easily and accurately. You probably would like your students to look at an analog clock and say, hey, it's this time. We want students to be able to do that easily and accurately. That helps in math and it helps really in your general life. Beyond counting and beyond uh, counting in time, students might want to have fluency with things related to fractions. So what are the equivalent fractions to one half? Oh, two fourths is equivalent. Three sixths is equivalent. Four eighths is equivalent to one half. If I'm thinking about finding common denominators, it's really helpful to be fluent with my multiples. So what are the first five multiples of three? Oh, that's three, six, nine, 12, 15. Look how easily and accurately I did that. And then beyond that, maybe fluency with geometry, fluency with measurement or working with formulas. Fluency is really everywhere in mathematics, even though many times our brains focus on adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. So speaking of those four operations, when students are developing fluency with their operations, there's typically some different types of fluency students will develop. So in uh, kindergarten, first and second grade, we ask that students develop fluency with their addition and subtraction fact knowledge. Those are the 200 addition and subtraction facts, like five plus eight or nine minus four. And the expectation is that by the end of second grade, students have fluency with all 200 facts. Now don't worry, I know a lot of our students don't meet that benchmark and that's okay. We'll continue to practice that with them, but that is a typical expectation. And then by the end of fourth grade, we typically expect that students know all 190 multiplication and division facts, such as six times seven or 56 divided by eight. So there's a lot of work that students can do there. Excuse me, I'm about to swallow there. Um, so a lot of students, that, that, a lot of work that students can do there. And by the end of fourth grade, we expect the students know all of those. Now altogether, there are 390 math facts. And this is the one slide that I will talk about memorization or automaticity. It is helpful when students know these facts. So first we're gonna talk about what these facts mean. What does it mean to add, subtract, multiply, and divide? We're gonna do a lot of practice with manipulatives and drawings, and we're gonna practice these facts again and again. But we also do want to engage students in activities where they're starting to quickly understand what does it mean to multiply six times seven, or what does it mean to subtract nine minus four? So some memorization comes into the fluency conversation, and more often than not, it's around the operations and facts. But with the operations, we also ask students to have fluency with their computation. Now you would never ask students to memorize any of the, uh, let's see, we've got sums and differences and products and quotients here. I've never asked students to memorize those, but I want students to have a strategy where they can easily and accurately work through the problem. Then continuing with rational numbers, can students fluently solve these types of problems with both fractions and decimals? And then as we move to integers, can students solve these problems where we have both negative and positive integers? Again, memorization is not the conversation here when it comes to fluency. It's having a strategy that students can use to solve these problems easily 
and accurately. Now I show all of these examples because sometimes, especially as I've worked with some teachers in the later elementary grades or middle school grades, really a lot of the fluency conversations are just about the facts. And the facts are important, right? It's very, very important that I know that six times seven is 42. But your fluency conversations shouldn't stop there. We wanna talk about fluency with all of these other types of computation and fluency with money and time fluency with word problem solving, fluency with working with fractions. And so when we encourage people to build fluency into their daily math instruction, it doesn't just have to be about facts. There's a lot of different ways that we can be focusing on our fluency. So now what I'd like you to do is two, two things. First, I'd like you to describe the fluency needs of your students. So do your students, students need counting fluency or fact fluency or integer fluency? And then describe some of the ways that you can support those fluency needs of your students. Go ahead and take two minutes to talk about fluency. All right, so we just talked about fluency, and now we'll move to our fifth objective for today, which is a focus on word problem solving instruction. So word problem solving, where does this fit into our instructional platform? It fits in as one of the two strategies that should be incorporated into our instructional platform every time we teach math. So let's think about word problem solving. If you wanna make any notes, we're on the last page of our handout packet. All right, so when we think about word problem solving, I like to think about why is word problem solving so difficult for students? So these are seven areas that we have identified as causing a lot of difficulty for students when it comes to the setting up and solving of word problems. So first, let's start at the top, reading the problem. Probably you have some students that have trouble reading in math. And then that's going to make word problem solving a lot more difficult if you can't read the problem. And then tied to that is an understanding of vocabulary. 
both math vocabulary, so what does it mean if I see more than? It could also be general vocabulary. What is this thing? A-V-A, -A, Ava. Is that a person's name? I don't know that name. I've, I've never met a person named Ava. What does that mean? There could also be things in the story that students aren't familiar with. There's a word problem that we use a lot that has students folding paper cranes. Have they ever folded a paper crane before? Do they even know what that means? So there's a lot of vocabulary that has to be understood in order for students to solve the word problem well. Third area of difficulty is identifying what information do we need to solve this problem. And then tied to that is our fourth area of difficulty is, is there irrelevant information that I can ignore? And the kind of tied to that, this fifth area is, is there information that's on a chart or graph? How do I interpret that chart or that graph, extract that information to be able to solve the word problem? And then a sixth area of difficulty is selecting which operation or operations I might use to solve the problem. And then finally, doing the math, doing the computation. So I share all of these with you because you might wanna think about designing your word problem instruction to teach ahead of these areas of difficulty. Now, as we think about math teaching, especially math teaching related to word problems, there's two strategies that do not have an evidence base. So give me just about two minutes to review these so that we make sure that we're not doing these ineffective practices. And first up is tying keywords to operations. So here's an example of a keyword poster. On this poster, there are terms and they are organized by addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So if we look at this first example in green, Lincoln had eight pencils fewer than Roscoe. If Roscoe had 18 pencils, how many pencils did Lincoln have? If I see that word fewer and I go over on my poster and see that fewer falls underneath subtraction, then I could subtract and I would solve this problem correct. But here in this example, I still see the word fewer. And if I take that fewer and I think, oh, I have to subtract, I am not going to solve the problem correct. So every time a keyword works, a keyword also doesn't work. Now these keyword posters, they are all over the place. Very easy to find, very easy to print out. And many teachers might think, well, this is a good strategy to use, but it's really problematic for students. And let me show you a little bit as to why it's problematic. So we collected a lot of released items from different states in the United States, and we organized these items from grades three through eight by schema. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. And if you look in the yellow area, that's the percentage of word problems that have a keyword in them. So I might see a word like fewer or a term like more than or a few, uh, per or equal or share. Lots of different keywords out there. And then if you go over to the orange, you can see how often that keyword works. So we solved the problems using the keyword. And you can see that some of the time the keyword works 70 to 80 percent of the time. But in other types of problems, keywords only work 26 or 28% of the time. Now, this is for single step word problems. When it comes to multi step or um, you know, two or more step word problems, keywords really become problematic. So, how often do keywords appear in word problems? Well, that yellow rectangle shows you that it's almost all of the time. But then, how often do keywords help me solve that problem correct? Almost none of the time. It's actually less than 10% of the time. So here we want to think about these keywords. And so I'm not saying to not talk about these keywords. You want to talk about them. You're going to have a lot of discussions about these keywords. You're really going to use those keywords to help us understand what the problem is about, but do not tie a keyword to a specific operation. The second ineffective practice is presenting problems by operation. So if you were my student and I put this in front of you, what would you do? You would add. It says it up there at the top. So that means you don't have to read these problems. You don't have to think about them. There's no reasoning involved. You're probably gonna be a number plucker. You're gonna take those two numbers and you're gonna add them together. And here's an example from middle school. What are you going to do here? Probably going to divide. These are also problematic. They don't help students think about reading the problem, understanding what the problem is about. So we don't wanna present problems just by their operation. 
Now, I'm a former teacher, like many of you, and I was always desperate for resources. So I know probably a lot of you are like, well, I need more word problems. And so you print them off of the internet and they come like this. And that's fine. Use these word problems. Just remove the part at the top where it announces the operation. Let the students decide for themselves whether they are going to add, subtract, multiply, divide, or do some combination of that. So what should we do when it comes to word problem solving? I'll leave you with two effective practices. The first is to teach students to use an attack strategy, and the second is to teach students about the schemas. Let's briefly talk about each of these. So an attack strategy is a step-by-step -step process for working through a word problem. Here are two examples of attack strategies. If you look at both of these, you'll notice that the first thing is to read the problem. And every good attack strategy encourages students to read the problem first. Because I'm not with you and your students, but I could guarantee that a lot of your students don't read the problems first. So here are two attack strategies, ride and ridges. Both of these have a mnemonic to help us make it easier to remember them. Here are two other attack strategies, star and rice. Here are two more, shines and super. And then here are two of the three pro most popular attack strategies. I'll say probably, I haven't collected data on that, but probably these are the ones we see the most often. On the left-hand side, you see the solve attack strategy. You study the problem, that's reading it, and then you have a step-by-step -step process for working through the problem. And then on the right is the cube strategy. A lot of teachers use this in schools. It's a fine strategy to use. I would encourage you that if you are using the cube strategy, please turn it into R cubes so that students read the problem before they start doing the rest of the cubes things. And then this is one of the attack strategies that I use most often, UPS check. Here students understand the problem by reading it, they make a plan, they solve, and they go back and check their work. So I'd like you to briefly in the chat Drop your favorite attack strategy. So take just, we'll do 30 seconds here to describe your favorite attack strategy, and then we'll talk about the word problem schemas. All right, so we just talked about that attack strategy, and now we're going to combine that attack strategy with a focus on word problem schemas. So schemas, the word schema, it, you may have used that before, you may have not, but it also could be interpreted as a structure or a problem type. And there are six common schemas or problem types that we see in word problem solving across grades K through eight. In first, second, and third grade, there are three schemas that students regularly see, the total, difference, and change schemas. In grade three, we introduce to students the equal groups and multiplicative comparison schemas. So now there's five schemas across grades three, four, and five. And then starting in grade six, we introduce the ratios or proportion schemas. So then by grades six, seven, and eight, there are six schemas that students see regularly. And the advantage with a schema is that students can say, hey, I've solved a problem like this before. In that problem, we're putting together amounts. And if they can say, oh, I'm putting together cupcakes, or I'm putting together sharks and dolphins, or I'm putting together money, it doesn't matter what you're putting together. If students recognize that they're putting things together and then know how to solve a problem where they're putting amounts together, it makes word problem solving easier. So here are some brief examples of these different schemas. So with the total schema, we have parts that are put together for a total. So the three consistent components in a total problem are we have parts that are put together for a total. In the difference schema, we have amounts that are compared for a difference. So there's a greater amount, a lesser amount, 
and we compare those for a difference. With the change schema, we have an amount that, oops, I went too quick, but that's okay because I've got this double because we have increase and decrease. With the change schema, we have an amount that increases or decreases. So every change problem has a start amount, a change, and an end. With the equal group schema, we have groups with an equal number in each group. So here I have groups with an equal number in each of those groups. With the multiplicative comparison schema, we have a set that's compared a number of times. And then with the ratios or proportion schema, we are looking at the relationships among quantities. Usually if this is to that, then this is to that. So in the first example, we're looking at cookies to brownies. In the second example, we're looking at words to minutes. So those are the six schemas. There's a lot more information available about the schemas. If you want some more, email me. You can also find a lot of this online. But when students see a word problem as belonging to a specific schema, they are like, oh, I know how to solve this type of problem. And it makes word problem solving a lot easier for students. So the two recommendations for your problem solving instruction are to teach students to have an attack strategy and teach those word problem schemas. So we are going to go ahead and finish up here and I'll just do a brief review. So in our session today, we focused on five objectives. The first was to describe the core components of explicit instruction. So here we have modeling and practice and we have supports in both modeling and practice. Our second objective was to understand why the formal language of math is important. So we talked about using that formal math language and helping students use those terms precisely. The third was to think about different representations that we can use to help students understand what the mathematics means. There we talked around the concrete, the pictorial, and the abstract. Fourth, we talked about building fluency, not just with the operations, but fluency in all of mathematics. And then fifth, we talked about two effective practices for word problem and solving instruction. We talked about using an attack strategy and combining it with a focus on the word problem schemas. So thank you so much for joining us today. Again, my name is Sarah Powell. You're welcome to reach out to me via email or social media. And again, this slide deck and these handouts are all available for download. You're welcome to visit that website address and download, download them and share them as you see fit. So thank you so much for joining in today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.